Hello. Today, let's talk about God doing the impossible. The text before us is from the Gospel of St. Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. This is the Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary. Introduction. Aristotle says, It's impossible! Long before the birth of Jesus, a Greek philosopher was born who shaped the thoughts of humanity for centuries. His name was Aristotle. And though he lived 350 years before the birth of Jesus, his ideas continued to influence philosophers and theologians until the time of the Enlightenment, over 2,000 years later. Aristotle wrote about virtually everything. Among his topics were physics, metaphysics, philosophy, and logic. Here is one of the most profound things that Aristotle wrote. Quote, the infinite body will obviously prevail over and annihilate the finite body. End quote. This is cited in Book 3 of Aristotle's Physics, but to put the principle simply, Aristotle explains the finite is not capable of containing the infinite. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? It's reasonable, rational, logical. Something that is finite cannot limit or contain something that is infinite. A five-gallon bucket cannot contain an ocean of water. A moment of time cannot contain an eternity. It's just common sense. The finite cannot contain the infinite. Point one. Mary was greatly troubled. In this Gospel text from Luke chapter 1, we learn that God is not limited by Aristotelian logic. I'll tell you what I mean. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to Nazareth in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. The word virgin in Greek, parthenos, is a very specific word, parthenos, is a woman or a man who has kept her or his chastity. That is, that person has never had sexual relations. Mary is clearly a parthenos, a virgin. The angel greets Mary with God's blessings. Greetings, or literally, joy, O favored one. Mary does not know what this means, and she is troubled. It is not every day that she receives an angelic visitor with a message from Almighty God. Do not be afraid, said the angel. Then Gabriel explains God's blessing in three clauses. One, behold, you will conceive in your womb. Two, you will bear a son. And three, you shall call his name Jesus. Gabriel clarifies the message. He, Jesus, will be the Son of the Most High God. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and His kingdom will have no end. I'm guessing that there are several things that are baffling Mary. First, how is this going to happen? You see, I think that Mary believes what she has just heard. She is going to conceive and bear a son, he will be the son of the Most High God, and she will name him Jesus. Yes, Mary believes this. She knows this to be true. But she does not yet understand how. Second, and this could be even more baffling to Mary, she had heard all of her life that God was going to send a Messiah. But she had not understood that he was going to be the son of the Most High God himself, and that he would reign forever. Ever, how was her son going to live that long? And that was very puzzling. And finally, and perhaps the most perplexing of all, how was the almighty, everlasting, eternal God going to be contained in her little bitty belly? And you see, just because Mary believes does not mean that Mary understands. Aristotle would have declared, 
the finite cannot contain the infinite. However, Mary believes that her finite womb is about to bear the infinite Son of God, Jesus. She just doesn't yet understand how. So that's exactly what Mary asks. How can this be since, and now I'll give a direct translation of the original Greek, since I know not a man. The angel explains, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. To Aristotle and to the world, this is unreasonable, irrational, impossible. The finite is not capable of containing the infinite. But the angel Gabriel declared this, for nothing will be impossible with God. Point two, the kapak. In the mid-1520s, Dr. Martin Luther was leading a reformation of the Church back to the Bible through faith in God's inerrant, infallible, and inspired Word. But there were some words in the Bible that Jesus said that some men argued were unreasonable, irrational, and yes, impossible. For example, Jesus had taken bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner also, when he had supped and when he had given thanks, he took the cup. He gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Some people, like Ulrich Zwingli, objected to the words of Jesus. Zwingli said that it was impossible for the divine and infinite Son of God, Jesus Christ, to be contained in a piece of bread or to be contained in a cup of wine. Finitum non capax infinity. The finite cannot contain the infinite, he cried. And yes, he was referencing Aristotle and Aristotle's writings of physics and logic, rather than accepting the words of the Son of God. Zwingli was standing on reason rather than on faith. Luther responded that the word of Christ is a mystery. It's far beyond our understanding. But Zwingli said, finitum non capax infinity. The finite cannot contain the infinite. But do you want to hear what Luther said? Finitum capax infinity. The finite is capable of the infinite. You may think that it's not possible for a small piece of bread to contain the body of Christ. You may think that it's not possible for a cup of wine to contain the blood of our Savior Jesus. But tell me this, is it possible that Jesus, who is God himself, may choose to place his body in the bread? And the Son of God may determine to place his blood in the cup? Is it possible that God may do as he wishes and do exactly what he promises with his own word? You're completely backwards as you look at this. You're speaking of human limitations to contain God. But I'm speaking of a God who has no limitations at all. You cannot imagine that the womb of little Mary can hold the eternal Son of God, or that a host and cup on the altar can hold the infinite second person of the Holy Trinity. But is your faith so weak that you believe that Christ himself cannot place his divine body and blood anywhere and any way that he chooses? We understand that we have human limitations, but we must also understand that our infinite God has no limitations at all. The angel Gabriel declared that nothing will be impossible with God. 
You don't disagree with an angel of God. You don't disagree with God's own word, do you? Point three, I in them. Luther was declaring a divine truth. God uses finite things to contain his infinite glory. God uses human beings. God uses material elements as means of grace, as instruments through which he comes to his people and he gives us himself. Some may think that the finite is not capable of containing God, but God is so infinite that he is capable of containing himself in the finite. The infinite word of God became flesh and was born into a finite virgin named Mary. The infinite God contained himself in a finite womb. Furthermore, the infinite second person of the Holy Trinity joins his body to the bread on the altar when his word is declared. He joins his blood to the wine in the cup on the altar when his word is proclaimed. It is a mystery. It's beyond our understanding. But it is true because God himself has said it and Christ himself has done it. The infinite can do anything he wants, and he wants to contain himself in the finite. Luther offers us one more word of God that defies our understanding. This too is unreasonable. This too is irrational. This too is impossible. Jesus Christ, your infinite Lord, has not only joined himself to Mary and joined himself to bread and wine, but Jesus Christ has joined himself to you. Let it sink in a moment. Jesus Christ has joined himself to you. The infinite Jesus Christ is contained in you. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to the Father, The glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Jesus prays to be in you. Therefore, Paul writes, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And again, St. Paul writes, Christ in me, the hope of glory. When you were baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he joined himself to you. You were baptized into the divine name of God, sealed upon you, baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. At that time, he was joined to you and you were joined to him. You became a little Christ and all of the inheritance that is Christ's also was given to you. You see, beloved, God has done the impossible. He has made the finite contain the infinite. God did this to you by grace through faith. So infinite Jesus is in finite you. Conclusion. It would be impossible for you to contain Christ in yourself. You could not possibly put infinite God into yourself. But it is possible, however, according to God's holy will and God's holy word, for the infinite God to contain himself in finite you. 350 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a Greek philosopher named Aristotle. He shaped the thoughts of humanity for centuries, and Aristotle gave to us a concept. The finite cannot possibly contain the infinite. But at least in this, Aristotle was wrong. The finite is capable of containing the infinite. It's unreasonable, irrational, impossible, yes. But God has done it anyway. Your Lord Jesus Christ has placed himself, contained himself, in Mary, in the bread and cup on the altar, and in you. Because nothing will be impossible with God. Amen.